Well, you have to pardon me if I sound a little froggy this morning. I uh, came down with a cold conveniently at the Bethlehem Pastors Conference uh, this past week, which was a wonderful time, but it provided, as I shared with the worship team earlier, uh, Pastor Josh from Wausau came with, and uh, as I came down with a cold on Monday, and we're in the same room sleeping, Josh did not sleep at all because my breathing was through my mouth instead of through my nose like it should be, so I snored and snored and snored. Thankfully, we're on the tail end of this, but uh, you should stay awake for other reasons this morning because you are sitting under the Word of God. Uh, this morning, I'm going to give you some great advice. The title of the message is Don't Believe in Yourself. Uh, you won't find that anywhere uh, at Target or Walmart or anywhere you can find greeting cards, but I will tell you right now, don't believe in yourself is what Jesus wants for you to take away from the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Do not believe in yourself at all. There, that's that. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14 is where we're going. I will read this to you. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves. So some who believed in themselves, some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. The tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Here's our big idea for the morning, and uh, we don't have the time as we've been going through Luke. We want to kind of expedite the process. We, we don't want to spend like four or five years in the book of Luke. We're just spending a couple. And so uh, chapter 18, um, wanted to kind of focus on this this morning, especially because it's Communion Sunday. And it really encapsulates the heart of the Christian life. As a church, we talk about being a gospel-centered church. This is something that we want to rehearse to ourselves regularly, this truth, because unfortunately, as we will see, it can get lost quite easily. But the big idea for you guys to take away from this morning is that the heart of the gospel and the gospel-centered life, and I'll just add gospel-centered church, didn't even put that in there, put it in there now, the heart of the gospel and the gospel-centered life, the gospel-centered church is a humility that recognizes we bring nothing to God except a need to be made right. So it's a humility that recognizes we bring nothing to God except a need to be made right. Uh, the reason why I'm putting that specifically there, that need to be made right, is Jesus talks here about justification. He talks about uh, that the tax collector, upon this humble acknowledgement of his sin and need before God, goes home to his house, justified, that is, he has been made right, he has been counted righteous, he has been justified, he's been reckoned righteous, and that is the need that we have as human beings, because our performance won't work. Performance will not accomplish anything, as the Pharisee makes abundantly clear and Jesus' assessment of him. So, at the heart of the gospel and the gospel-centered life and the gospel-centered church, because we want people to smell us as a church this way, we want to be humble and recognize we bring nothing to God except the need to be made right. So really, don't believe in yourself. Let's go back to Luke 18, verses 9 through 10. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So let's set the table here. Uh, this is a parable. This is not necessarily an account of something that happened, although it may have very well happened. Uh, what is happening here is you have two gentlemen who are going up to the temple. Now, the temple, as you are aware most likely, was the place uh, in which the people of Israel would draw near to God, and you would have the most holy place where you'd have uh, somebody who would go, a, a priest who would go just once a year, very, very, very central uh, to the, the Jewish relationship with God was where atonement would be made and this priest would go in front and yet there was one time a year, one priest who would do it. The rest of the time, the holiness kind of uh, it went out. The holiness went out. So it, it starts here and then the courts kind of go out this way. And so you have a Pharisee, a man who was very well versed in scripture, who had many things right in his understanding of the Bible. But he had a certain attitude about him that is condemned regularly by Jesus because what the Pharisees did, and 
and they specialized in doing was they looked at their performance and they fundamentally believed that they, if you picture the temple, you picture holiness right at the center, they fundamentally believed that they could draw as close as possible to the center of the temple on their performance. And we'll make a point of this in a little while, that religiosity on its own, you, you, you may be able to accomplish certain things, but if you're missing a very crucial aspect of it, which is an understanding of who God actually is, not just who you want him to be, not just who you view him to be, not just who you think your performance is sufficient for, that if you miss that, you're missing everything. So you have these, these individuals, this group, these Pharisees who believed that on their performance, they could go as close as possible to this most holy place that they deserved to be there. And then you have a tax collector, a man who was ethnically Jewish, yet who is regarded as unclean because he participated in some extremely, extremely inappropriate activities, fleecing his people, ripping them off. It was his job to basically rip off his own people uh, as, as a proxy of the Roman government. So the occupying force, they, they enlisted these men to go and to take money and then take off the top whatever they wanted to. As long as Rome got their money, they could take what they wanted from them. And so they were deeply hated, deeply despised. And Pharisees were looked at as a people who were eminently Jewish. The, the tax collectors were looked at as those who were, uh, I guess, forgive the language here, but bastards who were illegitimate sons of Israel. And so as, as they went about their business, the two never met. They, 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 they did not talk to each other. Tax collectors couldn't testify in courts. Tax collectors would not be allowed in the houses of those who were righteous. And so to set the table here, you have Jesus telling a parable. And he's taking these two men, two polar opposites of a spectrum, and he's placing them together, at least in eye shot of each other in the temple. When they're drawing near to God because it was right for them to come near to God. And he's helping us understand something here about how we draw near to God. How we draw near to God. How we draw near to God. This is the critical thing. So no matter the cultural flavor, the human heart is self-righteous and desires to appropriate whatever it can to exalt itself. So if he sets a table for us in looking at, you know, what, what has happened in the first century here, I, I want us to, even as that table is set, take a step back. Even as the table is set to take a step back and to evaluate in our own culture how this type of thing operates. Because again, the, the Pharisees were people who believed their performance was good. Their performance was sufficient. That what they did was adequate enough to merit the title of good. Of good person. Now in our culture today, we don't necessarily extol spiritual goodness, at least traditional spiritual goodness. In the past, uh, you might talk about individuals as church-going individuals, and that was looked at as a good thing. So you have the nice church ladies. Now you think of church ladies, you think, hmm, we don't like her. She's probably snot. Just doesn't like people. Okay, That's what we think of now when it comes to that type of righteousness. And so it might seem on the face of it that what Jesus is talking about here has some irrelevance to our current cultural situation because if Jesus is simply uh, telling us to cast aspersion on spiritual self-righteousness that, that is located in, in performance according to the Bible, then it seems like, well, that would be irrelevant. But that's not exactly what's going on here. What exactly is going on here, and, and as this parable unfolds, says he is talking to people who trusted in themselves or who believed in themselves. He's talking to people here who fundamentally at the core believe their performance merits the title of good. And so as we look at our culture, we think, how is it that we in our culture today, how do we, how do we look at people and determine good? And, and there's, there's a way that people have come to do this uh, in my generation, in the millennial generation, into the Gen Zs and whatever is under, what's under the Gen Z? 
is something. It's, I, I don't know what it is called. Okay. Under Gen Z, there's something. My kids belong in that group. I'm sorry. I don't know what the name of the group is, but it's getting weird. And when it comes to these generations, the way that we talk about uh, the goodness is we, we use a term called virtue signaling, right? Virtue signal. So if somebody is virtue signaling, what they're doing is they're making a performance in front of other people to show that, yes, I'm, I am with what is culturally acceptable. So you can, you can hashtag yourself into the world of virtue. You can show up on, on, on the interwebs and you can hashtag Twitter, insert whatever the current cause is to look relevant and to look good. And so people will look at you and say, hmm, looks like a good person. Looks like a good person. That's replaced church going, but the same heart is present. It's a performance. It's a performance that exists on the part of an individual who is concerned to say, I want other people to look at me and think I'm good without actually having to deal with what's inside of me. We looked at this the other week in Luke chapter 16, and I'm just going to focus our attention for a second here. Jesus talking about the love of money the Pharisees had. They were all messed up internally, but... Jesus said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. So there's a word shows up again in Luke 18. You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Now, does that mean that if we decide, hmm, I'm going to, I'm going to make something exalted among men that God really likes. And so, hi, gotcha, God. That's not what it means. What this means is that the exaltation among people of human goodness is evil in the sight of God. The exaltation in the sight of other people to look at you and say, good, that is abominable in God's sight. Now, it's not wrong for you to want people to look at you and say, good reputation. Right? You don't want people looking to say bad reputation. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is living in such a way that other people see you for the purpose of exalting you. And we peel the layers back. We look at the very beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. God created it. You didn't. He created humanity. You didn't create humanity. He created you for his glory. You didn't create him for your own. And yet, in sin and self-righteousness, we reverse those things and we take ourselves into a place of saying, God, you are here to exalt me. And even your holy law, your righteous rules exist to show other people how great I really am. That's the heart of the Pharisee. And it's the heart of the person who today functions to look at things that are morally acceptable in our culture. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Romans chapter 2, Paul addresses two types of people who have this mentality. Verses 1 through 3, Paul says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? So here, Paul is talking to people who like the Pharisees, took the opportunity to harness scripture, to harness the righteous law of God, and to say, this exists to show other people how great I really am. And in the process, here's what inevitably happens. In the process, you, you look at yourself and you become very self-satisfied. I'm good. Blind spots be ignored. Who cares? Because I can look at myself in the mirror and say, you've done this and this and this and this. You're great. You're fantastic. You're wonderful. And anybody who tells me otherwise is dead wrong. Furthermore, furthermore, what I know is this. Even if I have blind spots, they're not as bad as other people. And it is my great privilege. Nay, it is my responsibility to point to other people who aren't like me. Now, we want to be careful here because 
As God renovates the heart, we talked about that last week, as God changes the human heart from the inside out, he truly makes us holy. And so there is genuine holiness that exists in the life of God's people. But this is false holiness. This is false because it doesn't deal with the heart. It deals with looking at oneself and outward performance and saying, I'm so glad I'm like this and you're not like me. And therefore you are worse off. So Paul draws this out here and he says, look, do you realize you, you just take a look at yourself, think about it for a second. You realize you actually do the same things that the people you're condemning do. When Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about it in terms of heart issues. And the Pharisees said, hey, look at all those murderers, evil murderers out there. And Jesus said, if you hate your brother in your heart, you've committed murder in the sight of God. You don't understand this? So God is interested in the heart, even though we're interested in our own selves by nature in being exalted for our performance. So that's one type of people that Paul draws out here. And then verses 12 through 16, he says this, for all who have sinned without the law, he's talking about Gentiles, he's talking about pagan people, he's talking about people who don't really care about what the Bible says. All who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, well, their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, uh, judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Now, that's, that's a really, 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 really kind of messy paragraph in some ways that Paul writes there. But here's, I'm going to boil it down for you right now. We're going to spend the whole morning talking about this. We could, but here's what Paul is getting at. He's saying, even those people who don't claim to be self-righteous by the same type of standards that a Pharisee might, show that in their efforts to be good and to adhere to moral norms, even those people show that they have this obsession with self-exaltation through performance. Even these people. And so you look out at the cultural landscape now and you think, hmm, the atheists, they clearly don't make any uh, claims to allegiance to the Bible. So how is it that you could call somebody like that self-righteous? Well, here's how you can do it. Examine them on what they believe to be good and ask the question, what is good for you? And I have a sneaking suspicion that 10 times out of 10, what is good for them will be the things that they do very well. And here's where Christianity genuine Christianity, biblical Christianity. Here's where the gospel is profoundly different because the gospel does, it comes in and it levels you. The gospel comes in and it, and it, and it up, attacks you and it attacks your self-righteousness and, and he comes at you. God comes at you in his law and says, you're not good. And I don't care what standard you use. You're not good. You're not good. This is how we understand the difference. And this is as, as this parable progresses and we see this tax collector and his relating to God a certain way, there is something profoundly different about this. And this is what belongs to the genuine Christian we see expressed. The difference between grace and no grace. Verses 11 through 13, again in Luke 18, the Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So mere religiosity that appeals to God is never a substitute for a humility that depends completely upon him. A ways back... And this is, uh, I'm going I'm to pay homage here to R.C. Sproul. I was listening to him in preparation for this message. And, and he drew attention to a conflict in church history you guys should know about. It's important. It's important for this purpose because you might hear the Pharisee saying at this point, when he says, God, I thank you. It seems like, like kind of a generous thing. Like, oh, that, isn't that great? He's acknowledging that God made him like this. But what's actually going on here? Uh, there's this conflict in the history of the church about 1,600 years ago 
Augustine, whom you should be familiar with. Fantastic guy. Augustine uh, had a, a prayer that was heard by a man named Pelagius. And we actually talked about this the other week where Augustine prayed, God, uh, command whatever you will and give whatever you command. Meaning, God, whatever you command me to do, I know I can get the grace to do from you. But it's not me to do it. So this man, Pelagius, who was a monk in Britain, heard that. And he's like, I don't think I like that very much because I think, I think people are able to be good. People are able to be good. Wouldn't it make sense? You know, how could God command somebody to do something that they couldn't do on their own? And so this Pelagius came and he went fisticuffs with Augustine theologically and the church rightly decided that Pelagius was wrong. Because surveying the history of scripture, from the very beginning, you see that the law itself is given to people who can't keep it. You can try, but you'll fail. And the problem that set in by the time Jesus walked this earth was that the people had become so convinced that they were able to keep the law on their own, that though they may acknowledge God, they didn't really need him for anything except approval. And so this conflict occurred, and what's important to see here is that Pelagius, as this guy 15, 1600 years ago, didn't discount God completely. But the important distinction here is that for grace to be grace, it has to be grace the whole way through. I had mentioned the other week that if you look at the Book of Mormon, which don't waste your time looking at it, okay, but there's a passage in there that rips off Ephesians 2 that says, by grace you have been saved through faith after all that you can do. And this, my friends, is a very clear example. And, and you look at Mormons, they're nice people, probably want a Mormon for a neighbor, most likely to show up and mow your lawn, snow blow your driveway, that kind of a thing. But the reason why they do that is because they believe what's baked into the Book of Mormon, what's baked into Doctrine and Covenants, what's baked, in, baked into their whole system of belief is that you can be like this Pharisee. You can be good. You can be like Pelagius, somebody who can exalt human performance and then they tack on to that some really bizarre stuff about if you do that well enough, you become a god, which is way crazy out of bounds. But it all starts with this fundamental belief that grace is grace to help you with what you can't do yourself. So chip in a few bucks, God chips in the rest. It's like when you take your kids to the store and they have a gift card and they see little woodsies, like my kids see little woodsies, they love little woodsies, they want to buy little woodsies. And they have like a $15 gift card to, to Target. Like, all right, I'll chip in the five bucks you need to get you a little play set. Grace isn't like that. Grace is instead God looking at you and saying, you, you have nothing. Absolutely nothing. And what you need, only I can give you. Now, there's a whole lot more around that, a whole lot more around that. But it really kind of comes down to this. You look at the Pharisee and you look at the tax collector. The tax collector understands grace. And he understands grace because as he looks at himself, he recognizes that he's awful. As I think about my own walk with Jesus, I spent 17 years of my life thinking I was pretty good. 17 years of my life thinking I'm pretty good. But guess what? You dirty, rotten sinner, Chris, there's a problem here. And you just don't want to deal with it. Because you know what that means? It means you have to, you have to walk away from where you think you deserve to be in the temple, as it were. And you have to move your way back. And this tax collector stands far off in this parable. He stands far off 
And he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He understands grace because he recognizes he has nothing to bring to God. I believe it was Luther who said that the only thing you contribute to your salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. And as a church, that's something that we really prize. It seems strange. It seems almost kind of sadomasochistic. Aren't you like, this is, it seems like kind of some spiritual self-harm. It seems kind of, kind of bizarre. Why, why, why do you want to focus so much on the fact that you don't have anything good in you? Don't you want to highlight some nice things about yourself? I grew up in a church like that. And you know where that leads people? It leads people to be the Pharisee who stands as close as he can to the temple, the center of the temple, saying, God, I thank you. I'm not like these other people. And as you see throughout Jesus' entire public ministry, he says to those self-congratulating individuals, you will have your lot in hell. So as a church, we don't want to be people who are convinced that maybe we can draw some good things out about our performance. Just, just prior to this, in Luke 17, I think it's Luke 17, Jesus talks about how you respond to obedience before God. And he said, here's, here's how you're supposed to respond. Effectively, that if you get a thumbs up on doing a good job spiritually, you say, I'm an unworthy servant. I'm just doing what I was supposed to do. I'm just doing what I was supposed to do. And that is humility. Humility, recognizing you're not at the center of this business here. You're not at the center of this business. In fact, if you believe you're at the center of this business, you're going to get further and further skewed in your understanding of what it means to have a relationship with God. So the reason why, as a church, we want to focus on the same type of mentality Jesus is communicating here is because the more you recognize that God is God and you are you, the more you're going to actually have joy. Because... If you really think about it, when you put your head down on your pillow at night, self-congratulating, I mean, what's it going to be when you blow it? How much is enough? And who is the God that you're really approaching? Because the God of the Bible is perfect through and through. And as James says, if you keep the whole law, but you falter at one point, you've broken the whole thing. That performance is impossible. So for grace to be grace, it has to be grace the whole way through. The Apostle Paul, the Church of Galatia says, Oh, foolish Galatians, talking to people who were struggling with this. They wanted to kick in some performance. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has was, who was bewitched you? He uses witchcraft language here. It's strong stuff. It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. What Paul is saying here to this church who was getting so confused because they wanted to start with Jesus and finish it out with something else. He's saying, this makes no sense. At your worst, Jesus comes to you. At your worst. And he says, I am fully sufficient for you here. So what makes you think that somehow you're going to impress him later on? And again, he uses witchcraft language. Like, who has been with you? Who put a spell on you guys to make you think that this is good news for you? The good news of the gospel is that guilty sinners like this tax collector in the parable can come before God and look at a perfect righteousness that's not their own, can look at a perfect righteousness of someone else, can look at the perfect righteousness of God's own son and say, I want that for myself. But in order to get that for yourself, you have to say, I can't do it myself. 
And the good news of the gospel is that you look at that and say, I can't do this at all. I declare bankruptcy. And when you do that, spiritually, you get everything. That's good news. But it ain't good news if you declare bankruptcy and then you kind of say, well, but you know what? I can take care of this debt over here, but it's got 400% interest every single day. You can't do that. You, you just can't do that. And Paul is helping these churches of Galatia to recognize that this is a fool's errand. It is foolish for you to try to do this. The tax collector understands grace because he understands he is bankrupt. Do you understand that? Do you understand? And do you treasure the fact that apart from grace, you are nothing? It is a liberating thing to recognize that your performance really, really stinks. And it's a liberating thing when you look at the performance of Jesus, who is perfect. And I recognize you can have that, but just give this stuff up over here. You have to give up the performance. Justifying the ungodly, Luke 18, 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So the writing over the door of the Christian life is always this. God is great and we are not. And because of the cross, this is good news to us who have come to embrace it. I, I am acknowledging here something that my very, very dear friend Seth and I, Seth is a pastor down in southwestern Wisconsin. Um, we have known, loved each other for many, many years. He is a very dear friend, was my best man. We were at this pastor's conference this past week, and he reminded me that this is something we would say sometimes. As young Christians, young campus ministers, 21 years old, somebody would ask us to pray at some event where there's all kinds of people there and it gets scary sometimes. The little punk kid has to pray in front of everybody. Scary. And this is something that we would say sometimes, say, well, God, you're great and we're not. And do you know what? That's true. That's true. And that is, that is, again, it is freeing for you to acknowledge that. It's freeing to acknowledge that God is great and you're not, if the cross is true. And that's, that's, the, that's the pun intended, that's the crucial point. The crucial point is, if God is great and you are not, and the cross doesn't exist, then you are toast. You're done. We're done. Because he's here, we're here, and ne'er will the two ever meet. But because of the cross, because of what Jesus did, he made it possible for you to declare bankruptcy and to apprehend perfect righteousness. So that when you see the cross of Christ, you say, God is great and I am not. And this is the most wonderful news in the entire world that God has made a way for that thing to come together. Romans 4, 1 through 5, incredibly important to understand how God deals with people. He doesn't wait for you to make yourself righteous. He doesn't wait for you to kick in a few bucks. Paul says, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham? He's talking to those Jewish believers who were convinced that they had still something to offer. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Remember the beginning of this parable, Luke records that Jesus told it to people who trusted in themselves. And this is, this is where Romans 4 intersects with Luke 18, because Paul is saying, don't trust yourself, but trust the one who justifies the ungodly. And Paul deliberately uses here ungodly. He doesn't say justifies those who 
make some efforts at self-improvement. Because as he highlights Abraham, Abraham's faith is counted to him as righteousness. Paul looks at the faith that Abraham has graciously given to him that says yes to the promises of God, that God has promised uh, in, in a righteousness that exceeds everything else. He has promised a, a son who would come. He has promised everything. And, and Abraham looks, says, God, I believe your promise. I believe it to be true. I believe your redemptive promise. And God counts that to him as righteousness. And so Paul is saying, don't look to yourself. Don't trust yourself. Just as Jesus is telling this parable to people to say, don't trust in yourself. Because God is not the God who looks at your performance and says, good job. He is the God who will look at human performance and say, not enough, not enough, not enough over and over and over again. And he's also the same God will say to those who do not have enough performance, who will say, if you rest in my son, you're welcome as mine. And that is what it means for God to justify the ungodly, where he looks at you in all of your stupidity, in all of my 17-year-old idiot teenage kid stuff, and say, Declare bankruptcy, Chris. Trust my son. Righteous. Completely counted righteous. Because I am the one who justifies the ungodly. When the ungodly see the cross of Christ, when they see this and they see it as theirs, say, this is for me. This is for me. Jesus died for me because he came into the world to rescue sinners. And that's me. Luke 9, 23 through 26. Jesus said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. I want to challenge you here to think about this denying of yourself and taking up your cross as something more than just like, don't buy lots of stuff you don't need. Part of taking up your cross is taking up the cross and recognizing you have nothing to boast in of yourself. We, we live in a boastful culture. We live in a culture, again, virtue signaling is how you, you people see, great, you're good, you're wonderful. But we also do social virtue signaling where we want people to look at us and say, you're, you're great, like, you're not just morally great, you're, just, you're great, you're awesome. And part of taking up your cross is living in such a way that you just kind of defer. You defer in the presence of God. You defer in the presence of other people and saying, I'm just somebody who was reconciled to God by a work that I didn't do. And I needed it. And it was done for me. So again, as John Newton said for the end of his life, getting old, not remembering a whole lot of stuff, but I do remember this. Jesus is a great savior. I'm a great sinner. Part of taking up your cross daily is recognizing the humility. When you wake up in the morning, thank you, God, that I, though I deserve, and this might sound harsh in our present context, might sound harsh in our present culture. I deserve last night to have had the ground open up and swallow me whole. I deserve that. Because I've sinned against God. How many dumb things did you do yesterday? I, I don't need a list right now. You don't need to make a list. But I'm sure you can think of one thing. Maybe two, maybe three, maybe a dozen. But you did something yesterday that wasn't perfect. And because God is good and holy, you deserve his judgment. And yet as a Christian, you wake up this morning and you can, you can open your eyes and say, I'm alive. I'm alive. Physically, but spiritually, I'm alive. 
I can look God in the eye, as it were, and call him Father. I can do this because I'm not looking to myself. And, and as a church, that's what we need to be. It, it would be absolutely horrible, 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 horrible to have any other reputation as a church than the reputation that says these people are small and insignificant, but they're loved by God and they love God because of that. And they talk about this God and his greatness. And they don't talk about how great they are. They don't talk about how fantastic a, a program or budget or any other number of things are. They just talk about how great God is. And they don't talk about themselves that much. That's a reputation that you want personally as a church. I'm going to finish this morning here before we move into time of communion by looking at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, Paul concludes his letter to this church that was, again, very, very excited about their own performance. And he spends a lot of time talking about just how crucial it is to boast in Christ, not in yourself, to look at your performance and say, this is nothing. Jesus is everything. And it closes up his letter by saying this. He says, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. What this means, most likely, because the, the Apostle Paul, he starts out this letter by saying, anybody who preaches a different gospel, let him be damned to hell. That's how he starts this letter. Pretty serious language. He closes up this letter by, by saying, he's like, I'm writing this in my own hand, because Paul used a fancy word, an amanuensis, for a lot of his writing. He had somebody write for him. It's like using Siri. Dictate to your phone, except the amanuensis would actually say the right things all the time instead of weird things that you may not want to say. And, and so Paul decided at this point, he's like, I'm going to sign this letter off on my own so you see how dead serious I am because Paul probably was going blind fairly early in his life. He's like, I'm going to write this in my own hand so you can see how dead serious I am that you take this gospel and you make it the center of everything that you are as a church and everything you are as a person. It's real serious, folks. It says, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised. So it's talking about people here using circumcision as a flag for the law. Obedience to the law is the way that you really made right with God. It's saying they want to make a good showing in the flesh. They want to look good in front of other people. They want to be exalted in front of other people. And only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. And he says this, but far be it for me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. He closes this letter, and it's just really significant. He says, peace upon the Israel of God. He's saying, you don't know who the real people of God are? You know who the real people of God are? It's those who look at the cross of Christ and say, this is everything who, with the faith of Abraham, look to God and say, you fulfilled your promise and it's for me. Paul says, if I'm going to boast in anything here, spiritually, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in the work of Jesus, not myself. That's everything. And so as the parable winds up, Jesus says, this tax collector went home justified, went home counter-righteous, because he looked away from himself. And look to God's mercy. So this morning, as we uh, participate in taking the Lord's table, I just want you to be reminded as you approach this, that when you take the Lord's table, you're taking something that was done for you. This is not, it's not a performance. You don't come and take this and somehow you're like storing up extra righteousness internally because of it. When we talk about this as a sacrament, we don't mean it's something where you, you're getting extra layers of fun and exciting moral goodness. You're coming and you're saying, something was done for me. Body of Christ was broken for me. Blood of Christ was spilled for me. Now as I take these elements, as I take a little cracker and a little juice in memory of him, I'm remembering that something was done outside of me so that I can find mercy for me. That's what we do together. 
So worship.